Our coverage begins in West Africa, where hundreds of youths on Wednesday evening hit the streets of Kanu, northwest Nigeria, protesting over the appeal court judgment that sacked Abba Yusuf as the governor of the state. This was as police dispersed protesters along the Dan Agundi area of the state on Wednesday. The fresh protests followed the certified true copy of the judgment, which appeared in public domain and seemed contrary to the verdict of the appellate court. Some of the protesters said they were ready to die as they demanded justice. Police authorities in Kanu have vowed to clamp down on any group protesting in the state following the sacking of the governor. In the meantime, the Chief Registrar of the Court of Appeal, Umar Bangari, on Wednesday said there was no contradiction in the court's judgment on the Kano State governorship election. According to him, what happened in the judgment's certified true copy was a clerical error. Now, he noted that it does not in any way invalidate or change the findings and conclusion of the court on the matter. He disclosed this in a statement on Wednesday. There was confusion in Kano State on Tuesday with the emergence of a certified true copy of the Court of Appeal judgment on the state governorship election. The widely reported verdict of the court last Friday indicated that the appellate court upheld the decision of the petition tribunal sacking Governor Abba Yusuf. And now to discuss this, we're joined by Hakmed Musa Husseini, a security and political analyst. Thank you so much, Hakmed, for joining us. Thank you, Blessings. It's my pleasure. It's a pleasure to have you join us as well. Now, looking at the development, what specific discrepancies or contradictions have emerged between the publicized certified true copy of the appeal court judgment and the initial verdict of the appellate court that led to the protest in Kanu in the first place? Yeah, I think the blunder was actually made on page 67 of the 72-page document. Um, so there are actually five areas of um, contradictions. Number one, I think in the first paragraph, um, the, the, the verdict actually stated that, you know, APC was right. And then in the next um, paragraph, then it also showed that NNP, NNPP was actually right. And then in another paragraph, then it says that the NNPP appeal lacks merit, which means it contradicts now, you know, the preceding paragraph. And then in another one day it says, you know, it actually dismisses or reverses, you know, the tribunal's ruling removing NNPP from power. And then at the end of the, you know, uh, verdict, it also find APC, you know, one million naira. Actually, the court find APC one million naira. So at the end of it, there are five areas of there are five basic contradictions. Each one of them is scandalous enough. So I think this is a, actually a huge blunder on the part of the judiciary. And it, it portrays the judiciary as clumsy and, you know, um, disorganized. And I think it is uh, something that the judiciary needs to actually, you know, um, uh, regulate out of, you know, that very unfortunate quagmire. And how would you say that these inconsistencies have fueled public dissatisfaction and led to the process? So actually, even before, you know, the discrepancies, even, you know, before when the judgment was delivered and even before the judgment was delivered, the atmosphere, the political atmosphere in Kano is supercharged. Both camps have been preparing their supporters for, you know, a showdown that both in the courtroom and on the street. So I think, yeah, there's this high level of, you know, political polarization within Kano itself. So, and you expect to see, you know, you know, the NNPP's camp becoming very dissatisfied, you know, by, you know, the blunder from the court. And, uh, you know, the protest itself is not surprising because everyone knows that the atmosphere in Canada is supercharged and then there are a lot of, you know, incitements going on between both camps. So this is nothing surprising, to be honest. And how significant is the involvement of hundreds of youths in the protests? What underlying grievances or concerns might be driving their willingness to confront the law enforcement and express their readiness to sacrifice for justice? Now, I mean, some of them even said they're willing to die to get justice. Well, I think this is, I think this thing is primarily a partisan issue. You know, even if the, it is the APC that, you know, actually is at the receiving end of this judgment, they are going to protest. So whoever wins, and that's, that's, some, that's kind of a funny thing about Nigerian democracy. 
every uh, faction that loses out now begins to protest, begins to you know claim that democracy is in danger. But when they are winning, democracy is no longer in danger. So I think this is a partisan issue, and, and uh, you know it is only significant to say to the extent that yeah, it has the potential for you know breakdown of law and order in the society, which is unfortunate. And I expect the security agencies to you know put all hands on deck to ensure that such kind of incidents actually do not you know result in breakdown of law and order and you know pushing the society towards chaos. Um, the determination of the police authorities in Kanu to clamp down on any protesting group, um, you know, holding for the democratic rights of citizens, the freedom of expression and the rule of law within the states, do you think that that would have any implication? Yeah, actually, it is quite a delicate balancing act between, you know, the police own responsibility to uphold citizens' right to freedom of expression and also to preserve law and order. And I think the primary responsibility of the policy is preservation of law and order. And if uh, you know the history of protests in Nigeria, are anything to go by, we know that usually there are some elements that hide that hide behind peaceful protests, you know, to foment trouble, to foment chaos in the society. So definitely, I would agree with the police that they have to, you know, take some very serious measures to ensure that, you know, these protests are not hijacked by some, you know, um, uh, by some criminal elements, you know, to to plunge, you know, the kind of into some kind of chaos. So the police, the police actually need to do their work on that. But at the same time, also they have to also respect the constitutional right of the citizen to free to freedom of expression. That means they need to also isolate and identify peaceful protesters in that regard, and also protect and ensure that such protests are free from any provocation or harassment. Security and political analyst Ahmed Musa Hosseini, thank you so much for joining us on the news and sharing your thought. It's my pleasure. Thank you. The pleasure.